talk. Yes. Um, okay. So um, last year, and I see it. But I can play. Is that on? All right. So last year at ICFP, I gave a talk on parsing. And I shared with you some of the advice that my advisor, Ellen Shivers, gave me uh, back when I told him I wanted to do parsing. Uh, he told me that parsing was a grad school Vietnam littered with the charred remains of would-be PhDs. Uh, so this, this year's talk is about static analysis. And I'll tell you the advice I give my grad students about static analysis. I tell them that static analysis is the academic war on terror uh, because it is both unwinnable and never-ending. Uh, there will always be another paper called Scalable and Precise Points to Analysis. All right. So today is sort of like a mini tutorial on how I think about static analysis, or really how several of us think about static analysis uh, of functional languages. So I'm going to start off with an overview of what flow analysis is for higher order programs. Uh, then I'll tell you what's wrong with it, and I'll show you two powerful recently developed fixes. Then what I'm going to show you is how to mix, meld these fixes together, because at first glance, they seem to be incompatible. And that is really the main contribution of the paper, is how do we get these things to play together? And what happens when you get them to? Uh, and of course, it's a static analysis, so the answer is going to involve fixed points. Uh, so what is flow analysis? Um, well, really what people generally ask is, what is control flow analysis? And it turns out, if you want to figure out, if you want to do control flow analysis, you're going to end up doing flow analysis. So let's answer the control flow analysis question and figure out uh, what that is. So given some call site in the function program, f applied to x, uh, the control flow question is, what is f? And um, you know, if we want to answer this question, we might as well just try running the program to see if we can figure out what f actually is as the program is. Now, we all know what's going to happen, but bear with me. So let's assume a CEK model of execution. So we have a triple for our states, so a control component, an environment component, and a continuation component. Uh, and it's basically, it's a state machine. So we take our program E, we inject it into an initial state, and then we start stepping forward. So we take a step, and now we're going to keep stepping forward until one of three things happens. The first scenario is program terminates. We're lucky. We can now look at all the individual states and just ask it, if you're calling f, f, f of f of x, what's f here? Um, second possibility is that it goes into an infinite loop, but it loops back on some earlier state. This is actually fine for static analysis, because we still have a finite number of states to look at. We can still answer the question, what could f be? Uh, the third possibility, of course, is that the program doesn't terminate at all, and it does this by going through, uh, by, by never repeating the same state twice. So if this happens, we can't know uh, if or how many times f is going to be called. All right. So how do we make it terminate? And by it, I don't mean the program. Of course, the program is the program. We can't change the program. I mean the machine. How do we make the machine terminate? And the answer is, we make it finite. Um, so now I'm going to trace through the steps to do that for the CEK machine. And this will give us classical flow analysis. So we start off with the CEK machine. We say, why might it not terminate? It's because the state space is infinite. So why is it infinite? It's because we have, inf we have structural recursion in the state space here. If you look at environments, environments are structurally recursive uh, with themselves. You know, environments can refer to closures, and closures can refer back to environments. So if you look in more detail, an environment is a map from variables to closures. And the, the closures have a lambda term and environment inside there. So the trick we use to get rid of the recursion is we just lock it off and we replace the closure with an address. So now, uh, environments are definitely not structurally recursive. But once we do this, we have to introduce a store because the store will map from addresses to values. So the store has its own problem now because it's got this infinite set of addresses there, but at least it's not structural recursion anymore. And we have another source of structural recursion which is the K component. There's structural recursion in the continuations, because every continuation contains the continuation beneath it. It's the stack. Uh, but we can use the same trick here. So we have a set of continuation pointers. These go off and live in the store. And now the store maps not only to lamp to closures, it also maps to continuations. OK. Um, now what we do is say, well, all, there's no structural recursion left here. So the only unboundedness in the state space is coming from the addresses. So we just declare by fiat that there's now a finite set of addresses. And this, is indu this induces an abstraction on the store. And that abstraction percolates across the entire state space until we're left with a finite state space for the CESK machine, or an abstraction, an abstract interpretation thereof, really. All right, so that, that's 
really sort of classical flow analysis in a nutshell. Because now what we can do is take our program, inject it into a state, and run it forward, and we're guaranteed that this execution will terminate. Maybe not deterministic, it may cycle back on itself, but it's going to stop at some point. There's only a finite amount of room to run. So we can ask the question, you know, what is f? Okay. So what's wrong with flow analysis, as I've just described it? Well, it has problems with precision. All static analyses do. So work, what's the problem in particular with, with flow analysis for our languages? Well, control flow forks and data flows will merge. And both of these are caused by the same underlying problem and have similar remedies. So why is this happening? Well, ultimately, uh, it's because of the way we abstracted the store. So when we abstracted the store, we just said, hey, now there's a finite set of addresses. As soon as we said that there's a finite set of addresses, there was the possibility that at some point we're going to reallocate an old address that we've already used. And this isn't a concrete interpreter where you can just throw it out of memory error. The abstract interpreter has to keep going. So what it does is it just reuses an old address. That's what it's going to do if it runs out. Um, and so what this means is that every address may have multiple values living there. So as you reallocate addresses, you're damaging the precision of the analyzer. That's what's happening. That's where the imprecision is coming from. It's from this, this you know, poor allocation of abstract addresses. All right. And what this means is that if you ask, what is f, f is called f applied to x, uh, it may say not just one thing, it may say several things. Say several things. It could say it's the white closure, the gray closure, or the black closure. It could be any of these. And what this means is that when you transition out of the state, apply f to x, you have three successors. And what ultimately happens is that this merging will make its way across the abstract um, transition graph that you're generating, uh, and, and or, sorry, forking will sort of work, work, work its way across, and it just wrecks the precision of the analysis. It's, it's highly detrimental. So, the problem here is that we have a finite store, and we introduce this problem to ourselves. Um, and luckily, there's an easy solution. And how many of you, by show of hands, have a computer with an infinite amount of RAM? <laughs> not, not the Turing machine in your head. <laughs> um, no, so. We all have to deal with finite grams, so this is a solved problem. So we can apply garbage collection in the abstract interpreter, and we can make better use of the resources available. Okay, so, so we'll do exactly that, which means that every time we transition, what we do is we look inside the state, we trace out the heap, or, or sorry, the store, um, and then we, we, we trace through the store, starting from the, the environment and the, the stack. That's our root set with respect to garbage collection. We throw away unreachable structure, and we pack the rest back into the original state, and we march forward. And uh, when you do this, you end up sort of preemptively cutting off the ability of, of, of forking. You preemptively cut off forking because values never merge. You know, if you look at different points, the same address can be bound to different closures, but not at the same time anymore. Now, you still get some merging. Even with garbage collection, you can run out of memory. And the same thing can happen here. Um, but now, but now you're making more efficient use of the finite abstract resources available to you. And what this ultimately does is it compresses a lot of the merging and forking all down to just a handful of states in the graph. So this graph is generated for the exact same program as the earlier one, uh, but it's obviously substantially smaller when generated with abstract garbage collection turned on. Okay. But even with abstract garbage collection, you're, you're still going to see some amount of uh, you know, merging and forking going on. Uh, and, and some of it's for a very different, different reason, but ultimately still related to this fundamentalization. So you're also going to see merging of return flow. So why do we see merging of, of return flow? Um, well, first let me show you what it looks like. So what it looks like is, suppose you have two calls to the same procedure. And you make the first call, this is in the abstract interpreter, of course, it says, okay, I'm going over to the body of foo. When you return, it says, I'm going back to the call site where foo was called, on to the next call. From the next call, into the body of foo, out of the body of foo, back to the second call. And then, for good measure, back to the first call as well. So why that happen? Um, again, it's based on the way that we abstracted the store. If you look inside the store, it's not just closures there, it's continuations too. So if you reallocate these continuation pointers in the abstract, you're going to end up invoking multiple continuations when you try to return to one of them. And that's why that branch showed up there. So the way to fix this is to abandon the idea of going fine. We need an infinite abstract state space. It's the only way out of this problem. But we still have to make that computable. And here's how we do it. So we start off with the CESK machine, but instead of threading the continuation through the store and then abstracting, what we do instead is separate the, the C and E and S components from the K component. And then we apply 
the address-wise abstraction. So we can finitize addresses. And what this leaves us with is a finite set of control states and a set of unbounded stacks that they get paired with, but for which there's a finite number of frames because the frames are also individually abstracted through this address abstraction. So what we have is a pushdown system. And in this pushdown system is actually the essence of another analysis you may have heard of called CFA2. Except that here it's rendered as a pushdown system instead of as a context-free approach. So CFA2 is a context-free approach to control flow analysis. Uh, and, and there the context-free is referring to the, the balanced nature of calls and returns. Um, and here it's referring to you know, sort of the, the pushdown nature uh, of, of the stack. Uh, but really it's two sides of the same point. All right. So uh, if we try to sort of naively trace out this state space, it's not going to work this time because again, we have an unbounded number of stacks uh, and they never actually terminate. So what we're going to do instead is the stacks get distributed across the edges in the form of stack changes. So you get pushes and pops or no change at all moving along the edges. And then once you have your pushdown system, there are um, summarization algorithms. You can just drop them in and say, what are the reachable control states for this implicit pushdown system? Uh, so it will trace them out and we'll find out that some paths are illegal. Where legal means uh, it's a path where you may try to pop something off the top of the stack that wasn't actually pushed. So that's, that's not a legal path in a pushdown system. So that stuff just gets thrown away. And in terms of the previous graph, um, or the, uh, the code I showed you, that path that gets thrown away is that second return uh, from Poo. So now we have precise matching column return. So, Next up, we should combine garbage collection with pushdown systems. Except, it's not quite that easy. We can do this, but it's, 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 we need a little bit of tweaking here. So let me show you the, the intuition behind how this is done. So uh, the summarization algorithms that will compute the reachable control states in a pushdown system for you are expecting the following transition function. They're expecting a transition function that takes a control state and a stack change to a next set of control states. Well. We want to do garbage collection. If you want to do garbage collection, you need to compute the root set of what's reachable. To compute the root set of what's reachable, you need the stack. And in fact, what you really need to pass into this transition relation is the set of all possible stacks that could ever get paired with this particular control state, which is unbounded. So this violates the contract of what the, uh, the summarization procedures are expecting. Uh, quite radically, actually. Uh, but the, you know, there is a way to fix this. So how do we actually go about uh, getting the summarization algorithms to play nice with uh, the fact that they have to also consider all possible stacks at every control state when they try to transition? Well, what we'll do is focus on the structure of this set of stacks. So if we look at this structure, we get lucky. We find out that the, the structure of the set is regular. And in fact, uh, we can recover this regular structure with little additional effort beyond uh, what we were already doing to construct the reachable control states. So the way we do it is by putting epsilon edges into uh, this, uh, the graph that we're synthesizing containing the reachable control states, where an epsilon edge connects two states that have no, stack, no net stack change between them. So if it's like push, push, pop, pop, they would get an epsilon edge between them. Um, uh, and then what you do to recover the regular language of stacks for any given control state is you simply ignore the pops. And what you have left over is an NFA that describes all the possible stacks in any given control state. You just say, make this control state final, and then tell me the language described by the real thing NFA, and you know the stacks right there. So it actually turns out we can sort of co-compute as we do this, this fixed point synthesis of the graph. Um, the language, or the, the language of stacks available along with the reachable control states. So the result, uh, well, I'll just illustrate it for you and what this actually looks like. So if you generate a control, a, a, some abstract transition graph, and then you apply uh, both abstract garbage collection and pushdown analysis to them, uh, the graph on the, on the left underneath here is just garbage collection by itself. The graph on the right is with pushdown analysis. So either technique alone gives you a pretty substantial reduction in the size of the graph, which is remarkable because you're getting you know, better time, so it's, it's going faster because there's, there's obviously less states to trace out, and you're getting better precision at the same time. And when you apply them both, you actually get smaller still. So it, yeah, it takes usually less time. There is some overhead in these techniques, so it's not always faster, uh, but it's generally faster, and you get a smaller, more precise graph out as a result. Um, there's a fair amount of math behind this. If you're interested, it's in the paper. It's also all on this slide. Uh, so <laughs> You can just read the slide.
slide if you want. Um, uh, there are some tables in the paper. You can check those out too. And there's an open source implementation available that you can play around with and hack on. It's released under the open source Crapple academic software license. Uh, so in summary, I'd say that you know, the, so the, the, the main point in static analysis is that is, is finalization. Uh, it's often what we're doing, but it's sort of double-edged. You know, it gives us what we want, termination, but it gives us problems, which is precision. Um, but we are, we are making progress against uh, the, you know, undoing some of the damage done by finalization. Uh, and we're, you know, we're just learning every day how to get a little bit better at skirting the boundary between um, you know, decidability and undecidability for static analysis. That's really what the game is all about. So, thank you.